Good afternoon, welcome to today's COSI seminar. Uh, today's speaker is Marcus Rashke from the University of Washington. And Professor Henry Katten will introduce him since he invited I, I get introduced yes. to do the introduction. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, my name is Marcus's background. He actually, he, he did his, his uh, BS equivalent in Germany at the University of Beirut, but I know I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, but then did a master's at Rutgers University before going back to Germany to the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics to do his PhD, which he got in 1999. Then he went back to the US again uh, to UC Berkeley to do his postdoc with um, Ron Shen at, uh, in the physics department there, I call it a in your office, I would say. Uh, after that, he went to the Max Born Institute where he had a, a, a permanent position as a researcher, but then again switched uh, sides of the Atlantic and went it, it, it went a little bit farther even to go to uh, uh, University of Washington where he's now an assistant professor. And he'll tell you about his work on optical antennas and, uh, for optical imaging. So All right, well, Henry, thank you very much for this introduction about my oscillatory career back and forth. <laughs> I've never seen it this way. <laughs> 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 But I don't want to make this a, I try not to make this a continuous wave experience. So we see it as a maybe more a pulsed uh, uh, event with some cycles. And so uh, I'll thank Henry and Margaret and, and uh, KM Lab for this kind introduction and invitation to come here and talk to you uh, about a couple of things we do. And um, I have just changed the talk a little bit this morning because I understand that a lot of you are in this computational optics thing. And, I will tell you uh, a number of things which we have done and, and got results which are published and ready. And then there is one aspect of it which I put in where, in fact, this is very preliminary work where we actually would need uh, computational support of uh, analyzing those data which, are, uh, which goes a little beyond from what we uh, are capable with our methods. So maybe there could be some input from your side. So I will talk about um, optical antennas in the broader sense, uh, in, in particular in two ways. One is where we actually study uh, the optical properties, in particular in the optical near field of plasmatic nanostructures and extension of this work in the infrared. Uh, this is one part also about um, ways of uh, tuning and controlling light on the nanoscale. And then the other is actually that we use that insight and knowledge of controlling light with metallic structures for a new way of doing very high spatial resolution microscopy, uh, where we then aim for imaging matter with very high spatial and temporal resolution. So we are really going for the femtosecond time scale in the nanometer uh, spatial dimension. And uh, to sort of t uh, convince you that there is really a lot of interesting physics uh, down there in these lengths and time scales to be investigated and also to set the stage of what technique you would need in order to access that. Um, if you look at the time and length scales of the elementary excitation in matter, uh, you will see that uh, the electron scattering length scale or the spatial extent of a wave function in a quantum well uh, or molecular interaction, and I'm a physicist in the chemistry department, I have to pretend to know a little bit more about chemistry, so in particular, self-assembly. This all happens uh, in uh, the length scale, not really on the atomic level, but uh, mostly in sort of the 1 to 10 to 100 nanometer length scale. So you would want to probe matter with that spatial resolution. You would want to probe it with those time scales, which are given by uh, the fastest process, which I will talk to you about. Uh, in, a, in a way, this is sort of the old fashioned. I know some of you are much faster now, but for us, the electronic dephasing still sets sort of is the few femtosecond uh, time scale still is still a challenge to access, uh, and then it goes into longer times, uh, the vibrational dynamics and carrier relaxation of the process. 
Now, if you want to probe matter with that time and length scale, you have a sensitivity issue. Uh, because you have to probe essentially on a small sub-ensemble or even on a, and I'll show you an example where we probe on a single nanostructure level, uh, essentially you have to deal with small ensembles of molecules or try to get a single particle. And so you, you, you try to uh, see if there's a way to combine all these three goals and uh, the, there's a big vision actually behind that which is largely unexplored and this is that actually as you get to these finite size effects, which you know from, say, quantum dots, uh, the confinement of the wave function, you know that the, the structure, the electronic and vibrational structure of the medium changes. But what is not understood or even touched on today yet is how really the dynamics of the system changes. And you expect it to change substantially as, um, as uh, you get to these confinement effects. And, and that's sort of what's behind it. So this would be a short talk if we would not be able to actually combine uh, these three goals in, in, a, in a way. And so the route to success is actually sort of sketched here. Uh, you certainly would want a sort of a scanning probe microscopy technique known for getting high spatial resolution. And you need to overcome, and I'll show this to you in the next slide, uh, the classic issues of the finite spatial resolution you can obtain with uh, light of certain wavelengths. And the way we do it uh, is that we take advantage of the apex radius, of the sharp apex radius of the scanning probe microscope to spatially enhance, or to, to, to locally enhance and spatially confine the optical field uh, into a region which is essentially then given through the evanescent character of the wave of the tip roughly by about uh, 10 nanometer which we can obtain. And for those who may appreciate this, there's actually also a limit they're associated with the skin depth of the metal uh, in that regime. So this also sets uh, the, uh, the, uh, the best resolution we can get is sort of in the maybe five to eight nanometer. Um, so the physics which is going on is that we are driving an optical polarization in that tip. If the tip is, is placed in sufficiently close proximity to the surface, you have to then match the boundary condition of the field at this interface, and that distorts that field. Or in other words, you can see this as a uh, image dipole you have induced in the surface, and then you have a dipole-dipole coupling. And then you look at the scattering out of that coupled dipole configuration, and that signal in could be a linear optical response, could be an inelastic, like a Raman response or a nonlinear response, then has uh, spectral information, which is really determined only by that to, see, to first order approximation by this apex radius. So the, the virtue of this method is that it's, uh, you have the high spatial resolution, you're not limited by the spectral range. Um, it, this is actually in contrast to conventional ways of doing the field microscopy where uh, you, you have a lot of wavelength issues and so you can operate this uh, all the way through the UV into the infrared spectral range and you can apply all the classic um, uh, short pulse spectroscopy methods uh, which are fully compatible because, and this is actually part of what we'll investigate later on in the talk, is because we have a very short defacing time in the metal. So we can actually, we are not limited by the lifetime or the defacing time of your driven dipole. And so uh, we are essentially can probe the matter here uh, simply given by the pulse duration uh, we are using. And so we are applying this technique in a number of different ways. Uh, one is that uh, we probe uh, field distribution of things of plasmonic nanostructures and optical antennas, and this is actually what I'm focusing on uh, today. Uh, I will not talk about it all work we do uh, uh, probing individual quantum dots and other dielectrics, and I will in the end just give you a flavor that this is really a very powerful technique where uh, we use it to study correlated electron systems, including transition metal oxides and superconductors, because for those of you who are familiar with the physics of those materials, that there is an interplay of the local atomic and electronic configuration and long range forces of strain and ferroelectric polarizations. And uh, they give rise to domain formation um, on these nanometer length scales, which we can access. So the obvious advantages of this method, and, and I have to, uh, should need to give credit, there's, this has been developed over many years uh, by a number of people. And so we have adopted a lot of this techniques of different parts and different uh, 
applications and then put it together actually in, in new ways. And so the, uh, to, to really set the stage and get you the, the right feeling again for the length scale we can access, if you look for example the visible, uh, the spatial resolution by far field microscopy you know, gets you sort of as good confocal microscopy techniques in the 100 nanometer or 200 nanometer range. Uh, if you do the conventional near field approach uh, based on an optical fiber tip, for those who are not familiar, you take a tapered fiber, shine light into that fiber, it tapers at the end, you have a small aperture at the end, and then you uh, collect the light in a scattered configuration or back through the fiber. That doesn't get you really much beyond sort of the 50 nanometer. And the reason is, and this comes down to actually a very nice uh, equation uh, from Bethe already from the, from the 50s, where he derived what's the light transmission through a sub-wavelength aperture size. And you see that this scale is extremely unfavorable with the diameter. So you actually die the signal death. So you try to increase resolution and you decrease sensitivity. And that's exactly the wrong thing. That's not what you want. You noticed, as I declared earlier, you want a very high sensitivity technique. So if you, if you gain resolution by sacrificing sensitivity, uh, and, and this is actually why this conventional way of doing near-field microscopy didn't really take off as much as people had hoped. Also, there are a lot of issues uh, about uh, getting a short pulse uh, through into that aperture. And so then you, you learn also from this equation that this process scales extremely unfavorable with the wavelengths. So if you want to go into longer uh, wavelengths, particularly mid-IR, which we're interested in to probe the vibrational response, phonons or molecular vibrations, uh, then you die the signal death even earlier, aside from problems of getting a right fiber, which is transparent in the wavelength range. And this is why for the near field techniques, you find uh, the spatial resolution limit in that range. And, and so now you see that uh, we are beating uh, both in the visible and the infrared, and in particular in the visible, it becomes particularly dramatic uh, how much uh, we improve the resolution. So that we can access a really new regime of the light matter interaction, sort of evident from this graph, if you plot the length scale and the time scales of, of different uh, techniques, uh, you know, the optical uh, methods can get you, and, and I'm, I'm glad to realize that actually I shaded this even below the one femtosecond a second so the, uh, to make the at a second folks here already into account here, but uh, you are essentially limited by the far field diffraction. And so the scanning probe methods, which give you very high spatial resolution, are slow. And so that's why we believe that with this approach of this tip scattering, near field approach, we can actually get into this regime of the nanometer femtosecond spatial temporal dynamics, which uh, is previously not explored. So then uh, back to the two topics I try to cover um, is for one that I will show you how we use that method uh, to probe uh, the near field distribution of um, nano antennas in, in the broader sense where we look at both in the visible as well as in the infrared um, of actually plasmonic nanostructures and infrared antennas which were designed for certain functionalities. And uh, I will also try to allude to you a couple of general aspects on antennas and the question uh, where you get the transition from the plasmon description into the antenna resonance. And then here is the problem which we don't have an answer for yet, but we have the data, so I'll show you that. And then the second part, I, I'll very briefly try to just uh, cover a few aspects on these transition metal oxides and the domain imaging. So if you plot the resonances you can get in metallic structures over uh, a wide wavelength range, um, you notice that you have familiar geometries here uh, your cell phone is somewhere in between, a little smaller at uh, shorter wavelengths. Uh, likewise, the wireless system here is sort of in the 2 gigahertz range. And if you then go down, and that's the question, is there a continuity or do we have a discontinuity in that process? If you want to scale these problems down into the optical regime, when we have certain metallic geometries uh, here, this is from our lab or with a collaborator here of an, of an optical infrared antenna, do we quali do we, does the whole antenna theory really apply as we go to smaller structures or do we have a qualitatively new behavior? And, and I've already given the answer away by saying that we have processes here where suddenly the optical cycle period actually becomes comparable to the scattering time scales of the electrons and this is why we get different types of resonances here. 
which are related to what's called the plasmon resonance. So let me briefly start on this side, and, and uh, because um, I actually spent time as an undergraduate uh, in, in Bonn, in Bonn was where Heinrich Hertz moved after he actually did the first uh, landmark experiment on, on propagating radiation and the associated understanding of the optical near field, actually. I, I thought I should sh share this with you. Um, uh, when he discovered and, and then wrote in 1892, uh, his study about, so the study about the propagation of the electric force. And so what he did, he had here, uh, he had an inductor which he coupled here uh, to this antenna structure. He had a, a, a size spheres here as a, uh, to have a sufficient capacitance. And then uh, what he noticed was that there's a spark across here when he turns this inductor on. And so then that's radiating electromagnetic waves. And then he had a receiver here. So the receiver was this, sphere, this, this ring with a gap. And now maybe the question for the students, what did he see? The professors are not allowed to answer because otherwise we would embarrass them. Because they may not know us. <laughs> they saw a spark. That's right, yeah. So you saw a spark here, and, and that, that tells, that was, that was it, that took, that, that's where we are now. Yeah. So that was really the first, uh, first experiment, his original sketch on that. So what he understood early was actually that there is an, a far field zone in the near field zone. So we are in the propagating far field zone of the emitter, and that's what you learn in, in E and M class. Uh, what you don't and always neglect, you always assume I'm far away compared to the emitter side. But what we are interested in now is what if we are closer uh, to the system than the size of the emitter? And that is already evident in his drawings of the electric field uh, as it emerges from his driven dipole through the, now let's call it optical cycle period. And he was well aware of that there is this near field component here and this is the boundary of it, and this is the reactive near field. So only a portion of that reactive near field gets actually cut off and really propagates into the far field. Locally, you have much higher uh, electromagnetic density of states in this near field region, um, and most of this field energy just breathes in and out of your oscillating dipole. And so this is actually extremely beneficial for much of our studies because even though we have small signals to deal with, but taking advantage of these locally enhanced field distribution um, really benefits uh, a lot of these experiments. So now uh, 150, no, what is it, uh, 200 years later, that's how it looks now. So this is a, a field simulation of a patch antenna as you have it actually right here somewhere outside the hallway in your in the wireless system. And so when you do antenna analysis these days, what you actually do is that you derive uh, the local vector near field distribution, because from that you can deduce the far field emission pattern in the, in the outgoing direction. And in the ingoing direction, this is why we like to know that field distribution, because knowing that you can infer back on the polarization density, so the current density uh, in, this, in the antenna itself. So this is sort of at the 2 gigahertz range, and now we go to the visible optical range where we are setting out to study um, plasmonic metal structures. In particular, we are very interested in triangular uh, metal platelets. They became uh, an a interesting model system for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, chemists like to put, uh, to functionalize them with um, DNA proteins or the like, put chromophores on it and then take advantage of the local field enhancement associated with these tips and corners uh, to get enhanced sensitivity for a certain uh, molecular sensing application. They are also viewed as sort of a prototype of some type of optical antenna if you have a gap which gives you a further enhancement and there was a lot of misunderstanding on this. And in fact there's a lot of fundamental Phenomena you could study if you have actually an adsorbate on this metal structure. There's a lot of interesting time scales to consider of the excitation, defacing of the plasmon, uh, the hot electrons 
following a short pulse excitation, the coupling to the phonon bath, and then the coupling with the molecular excitation at all these different time scales. So there is uh, a lot of interesting photochemistry potentially of interest. And what we found actually quite intriguing because there was also a theoretical prediction, which I'm coming back later, to what actually the quadrupole uh, mode looked like and that uh, triggered uh, quite a bit of excitement um, for a while. So then back to the fundamental aspect, what is actually a surface plasmon? A plasmon is a collective charge density oscillation of the electrons in the system. So you have the free conduction electrons which you can treat as an electron liquid. We have a coherence. This means that we have these electrons moving in phase uh, and we have a slow variation of this electron density. And so you can express this as an equation here where you have a, a temporal variation of this electron density and associated with the plasma frequency in the metal. So important numbers are uh, tabulated here um, the mean free pass of the electrons in uh, typical free electron systems, as you know, is gold, silver, aluminum, uh, sodium, and lithium, and others are also very good, but they are a little impractical uh, for the lab operation. And so this is then what I will also come back later to the Drude relaxation time parameter in the Drude model, uh, giving you for gold and silver typically 30 to 40 femtoseconds. So this is the time in which an electron would scatter with the defect or the like and lose uh, its initial trajectory. So we will get, so this is what we'll talk about in the beginning and then there are two more aspects which I'll come back to after having shown you a couple of examples. So this resonance looks like this, so this is a scattering uh, signal from an individual um, triangle here, or a, pl a prism made of silver, so here we are collaborating with chemists who have learned now to actually make solid matter with very high crystalline quality, low defects, and so forth. So this is actually a new development in chemistry in general in the field of materials chemistry that chemists were able to make solid matter of metallic and dielectric nanostructures. So we have these very high quality um, single crystalline uh, silver nanostructures, and this is what you see. They have a dipole resonance, which is intense scattering, and there is actually another resonance we also look at is this quadrupole excitation, which has a very small uh, scattering efficiency, and, and I will explain to you later uh, why this difference is. And the reason why this is actually a nice system is because it's a quasi two-dimensional resonator, and so as you increase the size of the resonator, uh, you actually shift the resonance into the red, and so that's shown here that for with, with increasing size, uh, the, your dipole resonance shifts to longer wavelengths. So that's why this is actually quite a convenient system to look at. Now what we do want to know is, we want to know the local near field distribution spatial resolved associated with the dipole and quadrupole excitation of this particle. And so what we do here is that we take our scanning probe tip as a local scatterer which we poke around in the near field distribution of this particle and then have the light scattered into the far field using this, local, this tip as a local probe and then do a phase and amplitude resolved detection of that light and polarization resolved. So we have a, a, an interferometric um, homodyne detection where a split off portion of that beam is then recombined with the tip scattered light and this gives us then uh, through this expression here information on the, uh, on this, on the near field um, distribution. So we have a total intensity uh, which is, uh, and this is a relevant term here, that we have a tip field and a reference field and then we adjust the reference between uh, uh, so to get the phase information about the tip scattered light. This is valuable because if you have a dipole or quadrupole oscillation you would have different phases of this uh, near field oscillation at different poles of that structure. So this is what we see. This is a small uh, triangle, the, actually it, it's not uncommon that in the, in the atomic force microscope it doesn't, you don't get the corners and edges look that sharp as they do in an SEM or TEM experiment. But then if you drive the polarization in this direction, and in this case these are just a couple of examples, we look at the out of plane field components, so we look at the, at the, at the out of plane uh, component here, then you'll see that the two here are the two poles of that dipole, so we have a higher polarization density here at the at the edge and a somewhat smaller polarization density at the tip. And I will allude to you later why this actually is and this is already in itself an interesting 
uh, result, and we'll see this again for the quadrupolar excitation. Here's an example where, you, where we polarize uh, the driving field in plane, and we look at the in plane components. So now we're looking at the field which uh, goes in the, in the in plane direction here. And now you see the two poles uh, at the respective edges of that structure. So this is what you would have expected. You can, you can calculate those field distributions, and, and that is not surprising that this is what you would have thought they should look like. What you may not have thought that it looks like is if you look at the quadrupole excitation. So here is a triangle, and, and uh, you, you polarize the light now axially in this direction, and this is the field distribution. Or we polarize it this way, and this is the field distribution. What you notice first is that we do not have, in neither case, a large polarization density at these, at these tips. And this was a big disappointment for a lot of uh, uh, surface-enhanced chemical spectroscopists because they had hoped that one can actually use these higher order modes for some um, uh, chemical spectroscopy. You also notice, in fact, that the, the very high resolution we get and how important it is because we have field variations. So if you look at the line, linear cut here uh, through that structure, you see that the field variations are really on a 20 to 30 nanometer uh, length scale, despite that we are at uh, a larger geometry. Now these look initially as if we would not have much of a chance to understand the distribution, but actually if you do the theory uh, and then compare the features we see in the, uh, in the calculation of that in the experiment, then we actually notice that we have actually a surprisingly well uh, agreement here that uh, for reasons which are in the microscopic origin not so clear actually that we get this very high local polarization density here at the edges uh, of this structure, and this is actually also seen in the experiment. Uh, we have uh, some polarization density here, of, which is out of phase with these two. And then we have, and this also came out in theory, we have a smaller polarization density at the tip. And uh, a little clearer when we polarize in this direction, we have, again, the poles at the tips, but then uh, the out of phase uh, regions here with this higher polarization density. And if we then think about this whole thing, then it actually becomes clear why we see uh, what we see. So the first thing we notice, actually, if you compare this field intensity, we notice that, as I mentioned in the beginning, for the far field, we have an intense dipole but a weak quadrupole scattering. For the near field, we actually find roughly equal uh, intensities. And the reason for that is that if you look at the arrangement of the poles in a quadrupole in a two-dimensional system, you actually have a locally uh, destructive interference of uh, the oscillation between these poles. And so you actually have a subradiant mode because of the partial local destructive interference, and this gives you a weaker far field emission. This is very different um, from a linear antenna where with increasing uh, mode, you actually get an increase in the radiating power. And this is actually also back in antenna design an important issue what has to be considered when one builds these patch antennas that one doesn't get a higher mode um, and then ends up with a high local field but a poor far field emission characteristic. The other difference is that as you go to a higher order mode you are actually getting smaller wave vectors. And so if you have a smaller wave vector this means you have a reduced damping so you have less penetration in the metal and so that is actually responsible for high near field polarization density, and that is what we see uh, in this experiment. Um, now, the interesting thing is that if we have smaller wave factor components, we should be able to penetrate also better into smaller constricted feature uh, like the tip of those, those prisms. However, what you have at the same time, once the sharpness and the radius here becomes comparable to the mean free pass, you get an increase in the surface scattering of the electrons. So you have increasing damping channels in these tips. And this is why we believe we see these relatively small uh, polarization intensities in these tips versus actually the edges from that structure. So that work uh, fits sort of in this overall uh, scheme where there's quite some intense uh, discussion currently about how one can drive and use those structures for a wider range of, of optical antenna geometries in, in different embodiments, so to speak, for a number of applications. 
uh, of, of actually detection and emission. Uh, I mentioned the molecular sensing. There's other ideas of using it for waveguide coupling and near field microscopy. And one of the big issues about using these plasmonic metal structures is that you have still a high loss. So metals are opaque uh, in the visible spectral range. And so you, you have actually very short lifetimes. You have very short propagation times uh, for these uh, propagation distances for these surface plasmas. And this is why it's actually desirable to see what happens if one would extend that um, further into the infrared. And so we have actually uh, done sort of a Hertz, no, this is stuck here. Uh, again, a Hertz type experiment analog, now not on, uh, to, in the infrared, uh, of linear dipole antennas. And so just to remind you again, here's uh, what, what Hertz did. Uh, here was his emitter. And then here was his uh, detector, his loop, um, which he moved through the far field and the near field region of his emitter. And notice uh, what he measured if he, he was interested in the resonant uh, of that structure. So he varied the length of this loop. And then he measured the spark length. And so the spark length gave him a measure whether he's detecting on or off resonance. And this is an antenna resonance of a dipole mode, uh, which Hertz discovered. So we have the loop perimeter and the spark length is the, is the gauge. So what he measured here is part of what you would now write in terms of the radiated power. Uh, this is the, the blue curve of a linear dipole antenna. You see the super radiant character for the multimode excitation because as you will see later when I show you the modes, you get actually this constructive interference. And what really made what you thought all the time, probably this half dipole resonance so special is that there is actually not that much uh, special about it. Um, first off, it's not exactly at half dipole. It's actually at 0.486 lambda. And this is the point at which the imaginary part of the impedance actually is zero. And um, if you increase the length further, you would still get an increase in radiated power. Uh, then there is a portion of some destructive interference, which I'll show you, and then it will rise again uh, to the quadrupole excitation. But the, the, this half dipole resonance has actually its origin in this uh, notion that the impedance uh, of the antenna is, is zero at that point, which uh, makes it the lowest loss structure. So there is actually a sort of point to using that. So what we've designed here, and these are grown by e-beam lithography, uh, we made rods or wires grown on a surface of variable length. And then we were looking for the field distribution associated with that. And so what you see here is a structure which is designed to be resonant actually for 10 micron uh, excitation wavelengths we used from a CO2 laser. And the image, this time specifically, phase resolved the out of plane field component. So that's, that's plotted here. So we see here the field pointing out of the table plane here and here it points in, so it's schematic here. So we have uh, this reference constructive or destructive interference. So this is characteristic from this dipole mode. Here's the associated calculation for the EC field component at a particular uh, optical cycle period. So what we find is if you vary the length and probe the field distribution analyzing that mode, we actually find that the half wavelength dipole resonance is not at the half of our 10.6 micron, but it's actually at 2.6 uh, micron. So it's much shorter. So what we have is, and one can express this through an effective wavelength scaling, where the system behaves as if it were irradiated actually by 5.3 micron. And so this terminology was introduced to take into account that if you have a lossy system, and we have loss because they have a finite skin depth, the skin depth is actually in the order of 20 to 30 nanometers, Due to that loss, the system resonates at shorter lengths rather than at the ideal dipole resonance of 5.3 micron. So you will get to the 5.3 micron ideal resonance if you had no loss in the system. And so this is then expressed an empirical factor, namely this, empiric, this, this effective wavelength scaling. But if you use that, and I'll show you in a moment, you can actually then use the traditional antenna theory with that corrected number of that effective wavelength scan to describe the full system. So this is the dipole mode. Here is the quadrupole excitation. 
So we have a single rod, 5 micron. This is corresponding to the effective wavelengths, and here's the, the quadrupole mode. Um, so we have higher polarization into here and less signal here. The, it wasn't as good uh, signal quality in this experiment, but it, it, I hope you're still convinced if you compare to what you expected from a simulation that uh, this is actually a pretty good match. We also get the higher uh, excitation and higher excitation density at the end of this rod because of a geometric field enhancement at that point, uh, whereas we have more extended and weaker uh, distribution in the center of the rod. So this is a quadrupole uh, excitation. And then we sort of clarified from that basis a long issue, which was thought of that when you have now a gap, as you have uh, thought as Hertz had, and as uh, you may have thought that this is an important requirement that you have a gap in your antenna. Uh, but that is, of course, only uh, where you actually feed your coax cable in and then do an impedance matching network to actually remove the standing wave pattern and basically make a short uh, that if you go to, the, if you make a, a coupled situation like this, you have two structures separated by a small gap, this system then behaves the same way as this uh, quadrupole mode where by tuning then the lengths, you essentially this thing behaves like two dipoles or an effective quadrupole excitation. So the gap here takes no special role in the optical range where you couple the signal in and out purely through the optical far field and not through a wire or a conductor. Uh, that's work which we are currently extending with our collaborator actually at Creole in Florida where the goal is actually to make impedance matched uh, detectors onto the gap which requires uh, that uh, we basically remove that standing wave situation in the center and have a current feed out and in and put in an optical rectifier, uh, a, a, a rectifier like a shot key contact onto that gap to then really read out an electrical signal from an optical antenna. But so uh, what we have here is then in inserting the gap we have a coupled dipole pattern and now with the new with the wavelength scaling we've introduced with our five micron effective wavelengths for the actual 10 micron excitation we can then use uh, conventional antenna theory and express the coupling between the two, di two dipoles through the mutual impedance which is basically what does the field from one dipole exert on the other and change its resonance and that can be expressed to this mutual impedance term um, which is actually, I, I don't want to, I just want to illustrate to you, this is actually an analytic expression which you can go back uh, out of the traditional antenna handbooks. And you find that if you plot that function, uh, this mutual impedance normalized by the impedance of one um, dipole as a function of distance, then we actually see the two special coupling regimes. We see a far field regime in which we get an oscillatory behavior which has to do with the uh, modes and their interference as we spatially integrate over uh, the whole structure. So here this is an interference term uh, depending on the distance with respect to the length of that structure and then the resonant wavelengths. And then once you get close uh, where you are within a range of a fraction of a wavelength, then you get a different nature of the coupling. This is in the reactive field coupling which is much stronger and uh, very sensitive to the distance uh, and then not, no longer wavelength dependent. So this is a purely geometric effect and that term and that, uh, that would be independent actually of the resonant length itself. So basically in this work we have sort of clarified a number of general optical antenna issues in the connection uh, with traditional antenna theory. And so then the question remains, is this a plasmon, what we've observed? Is this a coherent charge density oscillation and it is because when we are at 10 micron excitation, we have an optical cycle period of about 30 femtoseconds. And that is comparable to, and this is why we are close to a limit, to the collision frequency of the electrons. So this means that during the time your field turns on and off, your electrons are just below the onset of where they would make a scattering event before the optical cycle period is completed. And that becomes evident if we look at a plot where we plot now from the dielectric function value which are tabulated, at least for the uh, sort of visible to IR uh, spectral range, uh, 
if you convert your real and imaginary part of the dielectric function into the real and imaginary part of the conductivity, and that's what this plot shows. Maybe all of you have gone through Ashcroft and Mermaid, probably through the DC limit of that calculation, where we have um, the real part uh, gives you then your 650 uh, times, or 6.5 times into the 5 ohm centimeter. This is for silver, uh, the conductivity. And you have almost zero imaginary part. Now, in the visible spectral range, you have the other extreme. You're in a strongly damped regime. You have a very, very poor conductivity. Metals are opaque, as you know. Right? And so this is also why the visible plasmonics is, has, uh, has a lot of challenges associated. But in the IR, as you see here, is the 10.6 micron. Here's the, um, uh, here would be the scattering time for silver in this case. Uh, you see that you get this rise in the DC conductivity. And this is where, this is the transition out of this plasmon description where you are basically in an underdamped uh, regime of the electron scattering to an overdamped uh, regime of the classic antenna resonance. Just to carry this message home, if you had this plasma resonance going even in our radio wave regime for your mobile phone, you would not be able to actually get a narrow bandwidth out of your antenna and then not be, not be able to discriminate signals from your neighbor or from other antenna sources because then the spectral width would be given by that uh, cycle period and you would have a huge spectral width of that antenna resonance. So this is why it's actually beneficial and fortunate that the electrons scatter so that we can actually do RF, um, RF optics uh, and get narrow band antennas. So the way to describe now the stamping of that, uh, it, of this decoherence of event, namely the, due to this electron momentum scattering on these time scales, uh, you can write it as this loss in optical polarization as a function of time. Uh, it's, it's driven by your, your input electric field, but then this is your damping term. And so what we wanted to do in the next experiment was actually to look for uh, whether we are able to really do, do a, a time domain experiment to probe this electronic dephasing on these very short time scales. And so there is, of course, a way to do this spectrally. You can uh, measure in the frequency domain and analyze the line width and deduce from that uh, that time scale. This works if you have a reasonably homogeneous system. Uh, the alternative description is that you do a time domain experiment, uh, in simplest form, if you were able to do it. If you do a pump experiment and then watch this free induction decay of this to zero's order harmonic oscillator, so it damps in time. And uh, here's the expression for the uh, dephasing, the total dephasing of the system related to the line widths, and then to, to typically described in two terms as one is the uh, population relaxation and the other is where you have uh, a pure dephasing contribution. So there were e e attempts before to measure those lifetimes, in fact deduced from line width measurement in a spectral hole burning uh, experiment. Uh, where uh, one takes an ensemble of, in this case, plasmonic particles. They burned a hole in it and by depleting a certain subset uh, of those particles. And then from that spectral line width, they deduced a dephasing time of about four femtoseconds. Uh, one could do single particle extinction spectroscopy. And there's a very nice systematic studies as a function of energy, uh, where uh, depending on the diameter of the structure, and this is then related to a shift in the uh, spectral position. But uh, to a good approximation, again, one gets into these two to five femtosecond timescales for these dephasing times. So this is faster than the Drude parameter implies, which has in part to do that in the visible, we are closer to the interband excitation. So we also have a relaxation channel from that side. And also that we have surface scattering and. And the other question is actually the Drude model works for no good reason because there, there could actually be a number of corrections necessary to that. Why would there be this one uh, time scale working over this entire frequency range? So we were curious to see what if we do a time resolved experiment in a single nanostructure as we would need to avoid uh, the inhomogeneities induced from an ensemble. There were earlier experiments where people tried to measure that with short pulse excitation, 
on an ensemble, but that only then gives a lower limit because then you have additional inhomogeneous dephasing pathways. And there was a beautiful experiment out there on um, uh, using photoelectron microscopy, uh, which uh, again sort of indicated that one has these, you know, you five to eight femtosecond. Uh, but also there, there were inhomogeneities involved in the experiment. So we were curious to see, can we do a single particle time resolved experiment. So what do we expect? Uh, if you take a short pulse, uh, in, we are desiring a, s a pulse in the 10 femtosecond or shorter regime. If we write down the induced optical polarization in the time domain for a dephasing time of 5 femtosecond, uh, this would be how your plasma would ring down very fast uh, as expected and um, given by that by the time scale. And so the, the general expression is that you have your uh, induced electric field of the plasma response. Here's our damped harmonic oscillator term. Here's the oscillatory part. And here's the decay component, which carries these five femtoseconds. This is the driving electric field from the laser pulse. So a suitable system is, and this gets us back to our scanning probe tips we are using, we actually want to study a single tip for two reasons because first we want to use this for scanning probe experiments. Second, uh, they actually have a nice plasmon resonance, which we can tune. So this is actually the experience for our gold tips, which we use for our scanning purposes, where by changing the aspect ratio, uh, we can uh, tune that plasmon response in sort of the visible spectral range. Uh, if you have some inhomogeneity, well, you see then that reflects itself also in the spectral shape. And so, this, so if you can model this by making an a, um, an ellipsoid or a spheroid, a semispheroid to be precise, and by varying this aspect ratio you see how you can tune with this aspect ratio uh, the wavelengths for that resonance. So it shifts into the red as we make this thing more elongated going back to our antenna resonance. Now why the tip is a nice example and a good system to study. The reason is that the tip breaks the translation of symmetry along the actual direction. And so that allows us to do a nonlinear and therefore background free scattering experiment where we use the uh, second harmonic response of those tips. Now if you had a spherical symmetric nanostructure, then to first order your induced second order response is then only from the interface and they would destructively interfere. So if you have a system with inversion symmetry, then you wouldn't have a bulk contribution. Um, th there is a residual higher order non-local contribution, but that is actually small as it turns out in these experiments. So if you have an asymmetric nanostructure, we get a surface specific second order polarization, which um, uh, gives rise then to a forward scattered emission or in a uh, 90 degree scattering configuration. And so that makes it background free. So if you have a second harmonic signal from the tip, this is then specific only for that plasma response driven in that exit direction. So the way the experiment is carried out, we have a, a pulse excitation of that tip and then the emission of the second harmonic light uh, into that um, sagittal direction. And here's a, uh, a plot of that uh, emission which shows you clearly this dipolar uh, emission pattern from that uh, and so this is sort of how these tips look like. We, we try to etch uh, this, this uh, homogeneous surfaces so that we don't get any spurious uh, signal from the tips itself. So the uh, experiment uh, is in fact then a correlation experiment. We do an interferometric two pulse uh, correlation where we have a beam splitter and then going through an interferometer and then we have two uh, subsequent pulses following each other. Uh, at variable time delay uh, hitting this tip and then uh, it's just sketchy in the forward but it's actually in the 90 degree sideways direction where we detect uh, this second harmonic light either spectrally integrated uh, with a photon counter or with a spectrometer. Now for all of those who are familiar with pulse characterization this is the analog to frog um, but we have to deal with extremely weak signals. So we get, we are not using a photodiode, this is a liquid nitrogen cooled CCD array, so we have very small signal levels to deal with. So we have a certain measurement time required, so an experiment takes about 
half an hour, so and this is where our alpha second comes in. We need an extremely stable interferometer where we have this Marzinger interferometer with 50 alpha second uh, precision or deviation within 30 minute uh, uh, time scale. So this is actually it was quite a, an effort to get that to working right. And so what we are looking for then, if we have the second order polarization, so I showed you the first order polarization, here's the response function as we had before where we put in the damped harmonic oscillator. Pardon me? Oh, okay, so you're, you stopped earlier. Okay, all right. Um, Pardon me? Okay, well then I'll skip. Oh, that's okay, I can stop any time with the other parts, that's okay. So the response function um, would be the damped harmonic oscillator. This is in the first order case. In the second order case, uh, we would have a response function here, and then we would have uh, the two uh, laser fields for the second order term. So that would be the full expression, but since we have two degenerate pulses, one can simplify that term, and uh, you would get to an expression for the overall intensity, which we detect as a function of time delay, which would then be uh, the, the force power of the electric field and the first order response function, which would still picture this as the damped harmonic oscillator. So if you do this in a spectrally integrated way, as it's shown here, so we just take the total signal uh, and compare that with what we get if you had a system with instantaneous response, which would be, for example, a BBO. So here is the, uh, and this is the familiar autocorrelation function for a, a, the, to the driving laser pulses. Uh, driving the instantaneous response in the BBO crystal. And then this is the corresponding signal uh, taken. So this actually, this is a one minute or the, the, the seconds measurement with a photodiode. And this is a, a two hour measurement um, uh, of the, the tip scattered light. And you see that if you fit this with the equation shown previously, this is actually the, the red curve. Uh, and, and you see by eye already that this is broad. And this actually, if you fit that, you actually get about four femtosecond dephasing time. Uh, so that is quite fascinating, um, but what's also fascinating is that there are a lot of potential issues, in particular those who are familiar, which are not so much actually with uh, the long story of a proper laser pulse characterization that um, in these correlation measurements you're losing a lot of information about the initial response of the system. Likewise, when you would use it for pulse characterization, you lose information on phase and, and other phase factors which do not appear. And so if we do that then in a spectrally resolved fashion as it's used for a, uh, in the technique called in the interferometric or in this case the frequency resolved optical gating in a frog fashion. So this is a signal from the BBO crystal. So now we take as a function of time delay, we spectrally resolve the signal. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm out of time. I have to sort of rush through this a little bit. Uh, try to remember that picture. Uh, ignore why it happens and looks this way. But if we insert a finite response time and if you take a harmonic oscillator and model that frog trace, what it would look like if we had a, a, a response from a plasmonic tip, is in, in here's an example for different finite response times, you see how that broadens and spectrally narrows. That's actually as expected. But if you compare that with our data, we actually see that we have a much richer behavior and much richer dynamics so in, contr in contrast to the uh, to the pulse itself, you get you see that there's a, 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 there's features emerging out here of different intensity, and actually also the spectral there's actually an oscillatory component in here, and this is where I'm sort of going to that outlook where what we need to do now is that we need to do a analysis of these frog traces, and this is an example here, and that's as far as we got. If you take our frog trace, we can then deduce from that. Uh, the spectrum and the phase response, which gives us information about what the pulse actually looks like, which we use. And so then it's desirable to go and take from that BBO frog the actual time structure of the pulse. And we would want to use that as the input parameter to then fit the frog data from the tip to then get a model-free um, plasmon uh, response from the tip itself. And that I think it would be a quite fascinating thing to do because traditionally in optical spectroscopy people always insert a 
a model function, like a harmonic oscillator with correction of unharmonicity, and then fit the data. But what we want to do here is that we feel that if we adopt from a lot of techniques which have been developed for pulse characterization, uh, where there was a much more pressing need to really get a full reconstruction of the actual pulse electric field transient, uh, and I, my impression was this hasn't been used much yet to really uh, apply to systems where we get a finite response function. Okay, so with that I'm actually half through. Um, so I'll just skip to the summary. No, I'm just so then you, I won't give you a chance to that. So this, this is a class time. You have 40, 40 minutes or something. Because we started late, too, so that's why we did a little more. So in summary, what I showed you was that we are able to probe field distributions of plasmonic nanostructures. Uh, and the extension of the plasmon concept and the limit of it is to go in the infrared spectral range. Uh, we have a way of probing electron dynamics in what I believe in a new way, uh, in particular getting uh, access to these very short defacing times which are still challenging. What I was not able to show you is that we have a way of actually um, designing, in fact, a really nano-confined uh, field emitter at the apex of a tip where we take advantage of uh, interesting phenomena which occur if a plasma propagates on a tapered structure. There's actually the phase and group velocity actually go to zero as it goes to the apex and so the wavelength shortens and so we actually have here a 10 nanometer size emitter through non-local excitation which we actually achieve at the um, at the tip and with that then I should summarize, save the correlate electron systems for some other time, and should acknowledge then the contributors to this work. Um, so the graduate student in the group, Andy Jones, he did the, uh, a lot of the plasmon work. Um, he's uh, more coming from the physics angle of things, looking more at the visible side, and Rob Ullman is an electric engineering a uh, graduate student who then uh, brought the antenna aspect into it, and we tried to merge that. Um, uh, the postdoc, Katalin, and, and another graduate student, Sam, work on the correlated electron system. Uh, Alex did the time resolved experiments, and there is uh, quite a few collaborators I should acknowledge, in particular for providing sample materials of all kinds, and then uh, funding of various agencies is, of course, always greatly acknowledged, and then thank you for your attention. Time for a couple of questions. Can you go to the previous slide? In those uh, triangular... Uh, Which one? In the triangular uh, measurement. Just the summary, say? Yeah, it's a more summary. Good. Um, you talk about uh, homodyne detection, but this is just the intensity. For the triangle we have done, I, I've only showed you the, uh, the not, not phase resolved images. So the, that was phase resolved in the IR. Here, the ones I showed you was not phase resolved. Uh, the data don't look that pretty because it was harder to get the interferometer. See, we need a, it's an hour scan time. And that interferometer in that system needed longer distances because we shine in the system and back so they don't look, we only have line scans for that, yeah. And it, it, that's the total field interacting with the, with the probe uh, and the articulations didn't take it on the probe, is that correct? The simulation don't take account the probe and the general issue of course is, is in a bigger scale. As you put the tip into the near field you're perturbing the field you actually measure. That's inherent in this method. So we try to use tips uh, like silicon uh, which, where we know they have no resonance and that we get a minimum in the perturbation of the field we actually look at. And this is why we always look at another dipole resonance of something where we know what we should get. But that's, that's always an important concern that we are, of course, measuring a superposition of those things, which in this case is not desirable. But say for the examples where we image uh, the, uh, these correlated electron systems, we actually take deliberate advantage of the strong perturbation because that's in the contrast mechanism giving us information about the dielectric function of the material. Right? So there, this is sort of a different regime of that imaging. Yeah.
mentioned an inverse aperture size to the fourth scaling mm. for apertures, but you didn't tell us what it was for tip scattering. Well, in that case, you actually, uh, the, the plot, it, it scales in the other way because you get an increase in the local field enhancement with decreasing aperture size. And so uh, what's actually shown here is the field enhancement locally at the tip apex over the far field electromagnetic field strength. And so if you make the radius smaller and smaller until the limit you get to the skin depth issue when you're strongly damped and this tip doesn't even see anymore that it becomes smaller. The field doesn't see anymore that the tip becomes sharper because it becomes transparent. Uh, but then you get an increase in that local field enhancement. So you actually increase the sensitivity as you increase the spatial resolution, making the tip sharper. So if you have a, a fixed spot size of your laser illuminating it and you make the tip smaller and smaller, you get more photons back in your measurement? Uh, from the tip itself, yes. Right. Because it's still only maybe one <laughs> photon per pixel in that, right? <laughs> that's the, that's Sir, the I, just, I probably just missed this, but when you're doing that scanning uh, image of the little triangles, are you just looking at the linear scattering? That was the linear elastic light scattering, yeah. So this was omega in, omega out. Okay, they are, we don't. Uh, th this is, um, th so what, they, what the chemists do is that they start with a, um, a silver cluster, so a, a silver 10 or something with some organic ligands on it. And then they start a nucleation and growth process on that cluster. And then this cluster starts to grow. And then they control whether you get triangles or cubes or something, then depends on the ratio of the growth speeds or the kinetics versus the thermodynamics, which crystal facets are thermodynamically more stable. And so by tuning that ratio, which they do by adjusting the temperature because it's an activated process, then they can control the growth process in these different crystallographies. That's thing. The speaker. Uh,